By the end of this weekend, 48 states will have partially reopened in some form. Massachusetts and Connecticut are the only states to have strict stay-at-home orders in place statewide right now. And overnight, House Democrats passed a $3 trillion aid bill that would include another round of direct payments for Americans. But Senate Republicans oppose that bill, and so does the president. The House also voting in favor of what would be a historic change that would allow lawmakers to work from home, effectively voting by proxy, meaning that members would not have to be on the floor to cast their votes. Meantime, the number of coronavirus cases just keeps rising. Nearly one and a half million people infected with more than 88,000 deaths. Our correspondents are covering the story from all across the country. Let's begin with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez, who's in Syracuse, New York, part of an area that was just allowed to start reopening on Friday. Gabe, good morning to you. Kristen, good morning. In this part of upstate New York, construction, manufacturing, and some retail businesses with curbside pickup are back open. But across the country, what was once seen as a tug of war between the economy and public health is now turning increasingly political. From Arizona to Oklahoma, Wisconsin to Virginia, this morning parts of more states are back in business. It felt normal. Yeah. You know, like it just felt like something we haven't done literally in six weeks. The CDC director now says the agency's models predict more than 100,000 U.S. COVID-19 deaths by June 1st. And by the end of this weekend, 48 states will have started to partially reopen, including parts of New York, where Boyce Murdoch's construction company in Syracuse had laid off 22 employees. To get back to where we was before this happened, I see it being two years. In some states, the political divide is growing wider. The Republican-controlled legislature in Michigan is suing the Democratic governor over her emergency order. While in Pennsylvania... I am not seeing democracy. I am seeing tyranny. Some GOP lawmakers are urging residents to defy that state shutdown. Nobody has the right to take that freedom away from you. But Harvard University researchers say only nine states have met the testing levels needed to safely reopen, and the rest have fallen short. What I'm worried about is that those states are really playing with fire, that they're going to, uh, they might have big outbreaks, and, and in the worst case scenario, may have to shut down again. Still, it's clear summer is on the horizon. North Carolina's outer banks are welcoming back visitors this weekend. And several northeastern states have also announced they'll reopen beaches on Memorial Day weekend at half capacity. After NASCAR and golf return this weekend for the first time without spectators, NFL teams can begin reopening their facilities on Tuesday if state and local governments allow it. Travel is also up in the air. After complaints of packed flights on social media, a major airline is in preliminary discussions to get rid of social distancing efforts altogether. Instead, worried passengers will be allowed to cancel or change flights without fees. A summer like none other. Eric Hicks manages a clothing store near Syracuse University. He's now open for online orders and curbside pickup. To turn these lights on after the past two months or however long it's been, it's an exciting feeling. And here in Syracuse, many businesses have chosen not to reopen. Students, of course, are not back on campus. Four hours from here, New York City's shutdown order has been extended. The mayor there says the area probably won't start to reopen until at least next month. Kristen. Yeah, very different story in New York City. Gabe Gutierrez starting us off on a Saturday morning. Gabe, thank you. President Trump is doubling down when it comes to a coronavirus vaccine. On Friday, the president saying that he wants to see one by the end of this year, while also saying that America is back whether or not there is a vaccine. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is at the White House for us this morning. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Peter. The president's project has been given a name that shows the focus on a quick timeline. Operation Warp Speed is already supporting the research on 14 potential vaccines and gearing up manufacturing even before there's final approval to speed up eventual distribution of some drug. And as ambitious as that is, the president claims while a vaccine would be good, it's not a necessity. In this stay-at-home era, President Trump getting a change of scene at Camp David. While in the Rose Garden Friday, going to be a very hot one. The president exerting a force of will. And I just want to make something clear. It's very important. Vaccine or no vaccine, we're back. 
yet making promises for a new vaccine faster than the 12 to 18 months many scientists consider ambitious. We'd love to see if we could do it prior to the end of the year. The president tapped a vaccine industry expert and military logistics general to lead this project. Dr. Monsef Slawi echoed the president's optimism. And these data made me feel even more confident that we will be able to deliver a few hundred million doses of vaccine by the end of 2020. President Trump also countered medical experts like a masked Dr. Fauci behind him by again saying COVID-19 could just vanish. It'll go away at some point. It'll go away. Uh, it may flare up and it may not flare up. Dr. Fauci testified Tuesday. Will this virus just disappear? And as I've said publicly many times, that is just not going to happen. The vice president expanded the coronavirus task force to include more medical experts and the secretaries of agriculture and labor. Working late Friday on Capitol Hill. Some of the members say, let's take a pause. Let's take a pause. Do you think this virus is taking a pause? The Democratic-led House voted on a new $3 trillion relief package that is expected to stall in the Senate. And while that passed in the House, that will really now be a negotiating point for another effort at trying to get a relief package. And in a historic move, the House voted to allow remote voting for the first time in our history, breaking that tradition of lawmakers having to be physically present for votes and committee hearings. Peter? Kelly, another major headline overnight, the president firing another government watchdog. What more can you tell us about that? Well, he was required to give Congress 30 days notice, and he did so in a late night letter. And this is Stephen Linick, who has been the inspector general for the Department of State, an Obama era holdover who the president says he has lost confidence in. The president has the right to remove this individual. But Democrats in Congress are calling it outrageous. Some Democratic aides saying that Linick had begun looking at the issue of Secretary Pompeo and whether he used political appointees to do personal business for him and his wife. And also, Linick had briefed some lawmakers about Ukraine and related documents from Rudy Giuliani back during the impeachment era, and that may be a factor in this as well. The president has selected a replacement who has ties to Vice President Mike Pence. Peter, Kristen? Kelly O'Donnell with those new developments overnight. Kelly, thanks. Another sure sign that America is trying to return to normal. NASCAR is back this weekend. Drivers, start your engines! Sounds good, doesn't it? It's been 10 weeks since fans have heard that call to start a race. Tomorrow, they'll hear it once again as NASCAR's biggest stars compete at Darlington Raceway in South Carolina. But while the drivers and their teams will be back at it, there will be no fans in the stands. Tomorrow's race will be extra special with frontline workers being honored. Steve Phelps is the president of NASCAR, and he joins us live this morning. Steve, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And I think we can't can't state this enough, whether you're a sports fan or not a sports fan, a lot of people are excited to hear this news. It is a sign that things are slowly getting back to normal. We know a lot of thought went into it, though. So why now? And is everyone comfortable with this move? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Kristen. Uh, we're thrilled to be back. Uh, we've developed a plan over the last two months um, that was tailored for us. Um, and then we vetted it with local, state, and health uh, federal health officials. So it's a rock solid plan. We're excited to be back. Um, the drivers are excited to get back to doing what they're doing. And what, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, Steve, walk us through then some of the precautions that you've put in place here. Normally, these team rosters are about 16 people, uh, would be about three times what it's gonna be. It's gonna be 16 people. It would normally be much larger. What are you guys doing to make sure that everybody involved in this is safe? Yeah, Peter, if, if you think about a normal NASCAR race, we have, you know, between 2,000 and 2,500 people who will be part uh, of putting a race on. That number will be down to about 900. Um, there's a footprint that is there. Only essential personnel will be allowed to be in the footprint. Um, I'm not essential personnel. I will not be in the footprint. Um, and so we've, again, we've had a, a plan that is tailored to us. When you think about NASCAR racing, you think about the crews, the drivers, they're already wearing protective equipment. They have helmets, head socks, fire suits, gloves. Um, there's a picture right there. That's a, you know, the, the 
ability for us to go back because of how we conduct our races makes us unique uh, versus other sports. It's a really important point to point out, that protective gear that the drivers already wear. But what happens, Steve, if someone does test positive? What plans do you have in place for that? And could we see a delay in the season if that does, in fact, happen? Yeah, Chris, and we've looked at, you know, scenario planning for, you know, hundreds of different things happen, including, obviously, someone um, showing symptoms of having uh, the virus. So protocols in place that would allow for us to have that person removed. Um, I don't foresee any further shutdown for us. We had a 10-week hiatus. I don't see that happening. Um, there are replacement crews. There are all kinds of different scenario plannings that we've done for both ourselves, our own officials, as well as the race teams, productions people. Um, you know, it takes a it takes a village to put on a NASCAR race, but you know, it'll be a smaller village and one we're really excited to get back to. Steve, this is going to be different. Darius Rucker doing the national anthem virtually. When do the fans get to return to the track as well? You know, Peter, we're not really sure. I, I think that, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that everyone was safe going back to racing itself. And I think it's a great sign for the country that, you know, a major sport is back. It will look much different. Um, you know, this is the first time in our 72-year history where we haven't had a fan in the stands. Um, when it's safe to have fans back, we'll have fans back. Um, again, no timetable for that. Yeah, Brad Keselowski wins the poll for this thing. We'll be watching Darlington tomorrow. Steve Phelps, we appreciate your time this morning. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Now to some unwelcome news in these trying economic times. Many frontline grocery store and other big box employees will be losing the extra pay that they had been receiving since this crisis began two months ago. NBC's business correspondent Joe Lynn Kent is outside one of those affected stores in Los Angeles with more this morning. Joe, good morning. Peter, good morning. Kroger, which owns Ralph's here, is going to be rolling back that extra hazard pay for frontline workers starting this weekend. And this has customers thinking twice about where they're spending their money. Thousands of grocery workers are about to see their paychecks shrink, and some are taking a stand. Starting Sunday, Kroger, the country's largest grocery chain, is ending the extra $2 an hour of hero pay for essential workers. Amazon, Walmart, Starbucks, and Target are following suit by the end of the month. It makes me upset because we're dealing with being in the, the pandemic still, the coronavirus is still here. Villar Bates has worked the checkout at Ralph's, owned by Kroger, for more than a decade. They just trying to save a dollar. They can afford to give it to us. They just want us to work at our normal like normal business and it's not normal business yet. Kroger issued this response saying as the country moves toward reopening, we will continue to safeguard our associates health and well-being and recognize their work. Instead, Kroger will now offer a new bonus payment up to $400. But frontline grocery workers continue to be exposed to the virus. The largest union representing grocery workers says at least 65 workers have died and nearly 10,000 have been infected or exposed to COVID-19. Amanda Barr is one of them. It was actually really rough. I didn't just have just like the mild symptoms. Barr has worked the checkout at King Supers, also owned by Kroger, for 16 years. She tested positive for COVID-19 during the height of the panic buying. How much of a difference does $2 an hour make for you? We're not doctors and we're not surgeons or anything, but we are, you know, putting our lives at risk and we are putting our families at risk. That risk is not lost on shopper Esmeralda Rivera, who may take her business elsewhere. It's not fair because they're risking their life in working here. And Joe, overnight we learned that J.C. Penney filed for bankruptcy. What does that mean? That's right, Peter. JCPenney is the biggest retailer so far to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy following J. Crew and Neiman Marcus. JCPenney has long been struggling ahead of coronavirus. It accelerated its fall. It has over 800 stores, 85,000 employees, and some of those stores are going to close permanently. And this comes as retail sales dropped by more than 16 percent last month, Peter. And that's the most on record. Joe Lynn Kent with the latest on that. JCPenney, a big name for a lot of mm -hmm. Americans. Appreciate it. 
Some other headlines we are tracking this morning. Autopsy results are in for the helicopter crash that killed NBA star Kobe Bryant and eight others. According to the report, the pilot flying the helicopter did not have drugs or alcohol in his system when it crashed. Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and seven others were on their way to a youth basketball tournament when the helicopter crashed outside Los Angeles in January. All nine victims died immediately from blunt force trauma. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. We want to turn now, get a check of the forecast with Dylan, who is following this tropical system off the coast of Florida. Could soon be the first named storm. Good morning, Dylan. Good morning, guys. Yeah, it's the last thing uh, we need to hear about is the potential for the first tropical system of the season. Right now, we do still have some heavy rain. We've already seen about three inches of rain through Fort Lauderdale. Miami has seen more than two inches of rain. The Bahamas, about an inch and a half. You can see the, the rotation in the clouds there and the moisture being spun back to the east coast of Florida. There's an 80 percent chance of this becoming a named storm, and it is uh, looking like it would be Arthur if it does get named. That area in orange there, that's the development zone. The water's warm. Conditions are favorable for development. So either way, whether or not this officially becomes a storm, a named storm, it is still going to produce dangerous rip currents up and down the coastline. So as beaches start to reopen and the temperatures continue to warm up, we are looking for that as a threat, the rough surf and the dangerous rip currents. We'll also see uh, some of that rain start to make its way on shore. But rain is not so much the bigger issue. Again, it's just that threat at the beaches as we go into most of next week. And that will continue uh, up through the mid-Atlantic and into the northeast by the end of the week. And that's your latest forecast. Peter? All right, Dylan, thank you very much. Check back in with you soon, Dylan. Meanwhile, the bright lights of Broadway will be dimmed for at least another three months after an announcement this week that the shows won't go back on until at least after Labor Day. And now at least one Broadway blockbuster is being forced to close for good. NBC's Ron Allen is in New York's Times Square outside the theater where Frozen had been performed. Ron, what can you tell us? Good morning. Well, good morning, Kristen. Frozen may be just the first of many. It had a good run, nearly two years, some 825 performances for the Disney classic. But Broadway has been hemorrhaging money, millions and millions of dollars every week, since the shutdown happened in mid-March. And now, Broadway's struggling to figure out how to stage a comeback. With Broadway dark at least through summer, Somewhere. settle in with the stars on stage from home. Patiently waiting them. The entire Great White Way extending what's already its longest intermission ever. The spring season scrapped in mid-March. It's been about two months since I was last out in this area. How does it feel to be on Broadway now? It feels a little lonely, actually, you know. It's like, where are all the people? That's Tony Award winner Brian Stokes Mitchell. Most recently seen appearing from his New York apartment window, urging the city on as he himself recovered from a bout with COVID-19. <laughs> Live entertainment will be one of the last sectors, I think, to really come back. And you certainly can't social distance on a stage. No, it's very difficult. We are together. We dance together. We sweat on each other. We spit on each other. We sing to each other. We hug each other. We kiss each other on stage. That's part of what we do. He says smaller socially distanced audiences won't buy enough tickets to cover costs. A Broadway run is steep, roughly $300,000 a week for a play and twice that for a musical and sitting apart would destroy the magic. Even though you have your own place, you're still having this group experience with other people that you're sharing the armrest with and laughing together with, crying together with, experiencing this vision that's happening on the stage. Charlotte St. Martin of the Broadway League fears audiences won't come back until there's more widespread testing for COVID-19, effective treatments, or a vaccine. This glorious form of art, totally dependent on science. Every day it changes. We could be looking at September. We could be looking at January. We could be looking at next spring. Michael Fatica was an understudy. Olaf in Frozen. Now, like many connected to Broadway, hoping his unemployment benefits and health insurance hold out. One day at a time and having trust that people will want to come and see theater when it's safe to do so again. The economic hit here on Broadway and beyond is absolutely staggering. Some 97,000 workers in the theaters and the restaurants and souvenir shops around here rely on Broadway to earn a living. And Broadway relies heavily on tourists to buy tickets, some 65% of the audiences. And of course, nobody's rushing to New York these days. So a lot of drama here on Broadway, and it's very unclear when the show will go back on. Kristen, Peter.
Yeah, heartbreaking to hear those figures. Ron Allen, thank you for that. It's going to be an incredible day when people can start going back to Broadway. Yeah, one more reason. You hope the pandemic passes soon. Yeah, absolutely. So much we're missing during these times.